Hello, Tennessee volunteers. Thank you so much for joining us today. We've got a great discussion about the upcoming uh, bailout that's coming from the federal government. I want to introduce you to a couple of folks. First, we've got Brent Gardner. He is the head of our government affairs for Americans for Prosperity. I'm Tori Venable, state director of AFP Tennessee. And last but most important, uh, our newly elected U.S. Senator Bill Haggerty. He served in the Haslam administration, and after that, he was the ambassador to uh, Japan for President Trump. So, Senator Haggerty, thank you so much for joining us today. And I, I just, you know, I want to start off with the easiest question of all. What are you hearing from constituents about the $1.9 trillion bailout bill that's about to come to the Senate? Well, first, Tori, I'd just like to add that uh, before I before my time serving government at the state level and, and most recently as our ambassador to Japan, uh, I've been a business person. Uh, I've been a business person all my life. That's what's in my DNA. And I think it's that perspective that um, I bring to the United States Senate and any person with a business background would look at this bailout package. We're not even talking about COVID relief. You know, everybody's just accepting the fact this is, a, this, is a, this is something that's bailing out something that has very little to do with COVID. Um, this is something that any business person would be completely nauseated by. Uh, it sets all the wrong incentives. Uh, it encourages bad behavior. It encourages, you know, spending far more than you than you take in. Uh, and it's something that I think our constituents are very frustrated by. Um, I pulled a couple of um, a, a couple of letters from constituents just to share with you uh, the level of frustration that, that I'm hearing from constituents in Tennessee. I might read just one or two. To, to give you a flavor for it, if that's okay. Um, this is, I'm not gonna give the last name, but, um, but Robert from Nashville writes, as a business owner and a concerned constituent, this is nothing more than giveaways that me, my children and grandchildren are gonna have to pay for. This is not monopoly money we're playing with. This is real money. I'll just add something to this. The public debt per capita in America has gone up $10,000 per person just in the past year. From January of last year to January of this year, we've added $10,000 per person onto the backs of our children and our grandchildren. It, it, it's beyond mismanagement, it's sinful to park this kind of debt uh, on, on our future generations and it's wholly irresponsible. Let me share another one here. Sandra from Murfreesboro writes, this is not a bill for the people, but a cover for more money laundering disguised as pet projects. The American people should be the priority during these difficult times. I could not agree with Sandra Moore. We need to be getting shots in people's arms. We need to be getting kids back to school and we need to be getting parents back to work. That's where the focus should be. And we'll go over it some more, but this is just a laundry list of, of uh, you know, socialist programs basically as she, as she highlights. Larry from Cookville writes, please vote against the current COVID relief bill. Don't worry, Larry, I will be doing that. As it has too much money for the Democrats agenda. Passing out more free money just puts us one step closer to socialism. And I, I think he is exactly right. Uh, I feel like every Senator should be listening to their constituents and I'm sure they're all getting these sorts of letters as well. Uh, if you look at what's actually in this bill and it's about 600 pages long, uh, it's just chock full of programs that have literally nothing to do with COVID relief. We were talking about this earlier today. There's mon more money in here to bail out union pension funds than there is to do vaccine distribution and testing combined. That just puts this into perspective. You know, the $350 billion blue state bailout, this is going to, to states that have mismanaged their resources over the years. This isn't about fixing an immediate budget deficit that's been, been precipitated by the pandemic. In fact, a number of states revenues this past year have actually gone up because there's so much stimulus money that's gone into the economy. No, what this is about is fixing long-term structural problems that blue states have created for themselves by buying votes and promising more than they could deliver upon. And now what they've done is they've taken control of both houses of, of Congress and the White House. And the first thing they do is come back and you know lay in this sort of fix. And the fix looks like it's in. We're going to do everything we can, though, to fight back to stop it, to message around this, to let the American public know how egregious this really is. I think they've been able to get people to focus on 
how nice it might be to get a $1,400 check and hope that the American public doesn't pay attention to all of the other things that are in this bill that have literally nothing to do with the pandemic. And you know, my heart goes out to the people that have been affected by the pandemic. We all have. And it's through no fault of our own. This is something that was delivered to us by the communist Chinese. You know, they tried to cover this pandemic up. They silenced researchers. They destroyed samples. They forbade travel within China, even though you could get an international flight from Wuhan to Italy or Wuhan to North America. Make no mistake, the Chinese are the ones that vested this and delivered this pandemic around the world. That's not the fault of a, of a Tennessean. That's not the fault of an American who had their business shut down. And look, at the very beginning, we didn't know much about the virus. I understand why the reaction was we need to shut things down. The projections were that our hospitals would be overwhelmed, that we would not be able to handle this. But we very quickly flattened the curve. And states like Tennessee were in the lead. I was appointed to the White House Economic Recovery Task Force by President Trump back then. And we put together a framework for states to reopen. States like Texas, Tennessee, Georgia stepped up early and did that. And what we saw was our economy has, has performed far better. I bet at the end of this, you will not see a material difference in terms of the incidence of the disease. Uh, the shutdowns have had a huge incidence though, in terms of mental health. It's set our children way behind in terms of their education. Uh, it's had an extremely detrimental effect on our relative economies. If you look at the unemployment rate you know, nationwide, it's now below 7%, but go to California. That's what's driving the average up. You know, Tennessee is well below that. So we've got to look and, and, and put responsibility where it lies. And these states that shut down, you can, you can read into it whatever reason they may have had, but we should not be rewarding them or incentivizing them to continue to do things like this. The, the, these, these irresponsible moves long-term in terms of their pensions and, and other mismanagement or in the nearer term in, in terms of keeping their economies locked down and, and, and making people's lives miserable in their states. So, Senator, uh, you know, I really I appreciate you leading with some of the letters that you've received from constituents. And for those of us watching today, if he's got a great way for you to engage your lawmakers to make sure your voice is heard. And we're going to go ahead and put a link to that in the chat right now. Yeah. Um, it's, it's great to see that, that those types of communications are so important to you as as an elected member of the Senate. Uh, wanted to wanted to go back to some stuff that you, you talked about early on and you know, yeah. federal spending efforts should really be focused on helping people who are hurting. And there's a lot of people out there hurting, whether it's from the virus or the economic impacts of the virus. Um, this is really a, it's not supposed to be an opportunity to clean up those type of, of fiscal problems that predate COVID-19. Yeah. What message does it send when Congress does go ahead then and bail out those fiscally irresponsible states when really the conditions that created those problems haven't changed? I think it sets, uh, it sets up incentives that will encourage these states to continue the, you know, this irresponsible fiscal behavior because all they have to wait for is the next time they've got control and they know that the Congress and the, and, and the administration will be there to bail them out. I hope that we can make certain that they don't have control for, for a very long time, but we're stuck where we are until 2022. And, and I think that uh, many people on this call can make a real difference in terms of turning this back around. I think the Democrats are going to give us every reason to turn it back around as well. I talked to President Trump uh, last weekend and I said, yep, you, I, I just left CPAC. He was, he was going to be headed down the next morning. I said, you're going to find an extraordinarily favorable audience there. And the Biden administration has done such a great job of setting up the contrast because as he pulls down the policies that you created that actually made our economy take off, that made America stronger, the Biden administration is making us weaker at every turn. And I think he did a great job on Sunday of, of really coming through and highlighting that. Uh, he nailed it, uh, hit it out of the park. I think that's just a, just a precursor to what we'll be talking about as we roll into the 2022 elections, because these policies will not work to the extent they even have policies. I mean, look at what they're doing at the border right now. They're just removing everything that we had that was working. You know, the stay in Mexico policy had a huge impact on bringing, you know, border crossings way, way down. The wall was being built and having great effect. You know, you see what the Biden administration is doing. They're just undoing all of this mm -hmm. stuff. They've so, already created a crisis at the border. So, Senator, you know, and, and just moving back to some of the bailout stuff that we know is in this package, you know, what would this type of what, would, what are these type of bills? One point nine trillion dollars. What does this do to our ability to respond to potential future crisis situations? 
Well, it definitely dampens it because it's taking our debt to GDP up over 100%. It's, what they're doing is taking away our ability to respond to any type of future disaster. You hit the nail on the head with that, and I think that's, that, that, that's great foresight. Uh, the more we spend, the more debt we burden our economy with, the, the less resources we have to deal with things later. Anybody that balances their own budget at home knows what this would be like. We're taking on an exorbitant amount of debt as a nation. And that debt gets bought not by just Americans, it's bought by places like China. It puts us in a vulnerable position. So the, the more that grows, the more it weakens us at the same time. So we've actually already authorized over $4 trillion on COVID. Uh, yet there's still more than a trillion dollars that hasn't gone out the door. And we know the economy is on the rebound, as you pointed out, much more quickly than it was ever predicted. Uh, why is it that there's this rush to push out a massive COVID spending bill when we're seeing new vaccines come online, we're seeing people get vaccinated, we saw today a number of states have reopened. You know, what, what is the rush here? Uh, you're asking exactly the right question. One, what is the rush? And two, why does it have to be on a purely partisan basis? The four trillion that you talked about was, was delivered on a truly bipartisan basis. And you've, you've underscored one very obvious fact. That much money, four trillion allocated, even with big spending governments, they haven't been able to spend a trillion of it. Now they're going to put another $2 trillion on the economy when we can't even get this final trillion dollar put to work. We should go back, reprogram that money, allocate it and target it to those that need it and target it in a very timely basis. A great, the greatest portion of this $1.9 trillion bailout doesn't even get spent until the year 2022 and beyond. And this is not oriented or aimed at the COVID pandemic. This is taking advantage of a crisis to push a socialist wish list through on the, backs of, on the backs of our citizens. And again, they'll be talking about the, the, the relief check. They'll be talking about you know, a bumped up unemployment. That is what they're trying to get us to focus on. And for people that are hurting, I'm sure that's important. But what's really happening here is they are shoving through a massive wish list of things that are gonna be you know, spent over the years to come. And as, as one of my constituents said, it's just moving us that many more steps closer to socialism. Well, Senator, we, we certainly appreciate that. Just as a reminder to all of you who've joined us today, we're going to have a link in the discussion below uh, where you can have your voice heard by members of Congress. And we encourage everyone to be able to take action on that link or to be able to reach out to Americans for Prosperity, either in Tennessee or across the country, and find out how you can get involved in trying to push back against these policies, uh, which are going to continue to hurt Americans. Uh, Senator, we really appreciate you offering your time today. Did you have anything uh, closing that you'd like to say? Uh, Tori, Brent, I just want to thank you for your leadership and your foresight. And I would encourage all of your listeners, whether today or if they, if they look this uh, up later, to get out and message the fact that this, is, this package is not a relief bill for the pandemic. This is something that's going to create long-term damage on our economy. We are shouldering our children and grandchildren with more debt at a time when we need to be focused on getting, getting our people well and healed from this pandemic. Uh, it's a great distraction that they're doing. Uh, and it's an opportunity, I think, that they're using to push through things they could never get done on a bipartisan basis. You've mentioned some of them today, uh, but I hope this conversation continues. My plan is to highlight this as much as I can over the coming days about what this package really is and how damaging it's gonna be to our economy and to our nation. Well, Senator, we can't tell you how much we appreciate your time talking about this today and your leadership against policies like this. For those of you who are joining us, just one final reminder, please take an opportunity to go down in the chat to select the link and to make sure that your voice is heard. Um, from all of us here at AFP, Senator, thank you. And uh, we yeah. really appreciate you joining us today. Great. Great to be with you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Tim.